Dystopia tonight. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, an impromptu uh, episode of Dystopia Tonight, because um, COVID's raging, I guess, again, and RSV and the flu, and we needed an update from our resident smart person, uh, Heather <laughs> uh, Butts, um, who, is, who is, by the way, a uh, public health expert and the one who's been guiding us through COVID this entire time. Um, so everything, you know, what's crazy to me is like, I'm not surprised by any of this because you've prepared us so well or me, you know what I mean? Like, so well, by the way, with me tonight is one of my, uh, closest friends, uh, who is also an amazing graphic designer and artist, Diana Redubel. She's going to be co-hosting with me because Tom is on, um, location in Kuala Lumpur and he's missing his family and friends. And I'm just kidding. He's really not. I, I don't know where Tom is. Tom's at a gig, I think. Also known as uh, Point Pleasant, Jersey. Yeah, yeah, Point Pleasant Beach, New Jersey. That's where Tom is. It's very similar to, to well, from what I've heard, weather-wise. Hey. Yeah, uh, apparently. But um, yeah, but that's it. I mean, I just, uh, we felt like doing this because I was technically going to take the month off. And then, uh, but Heather and I have been talking literally every day about uh, the clusterfuck that is, you know, uh, just just COVID and shit. And New York recently, what was it like yesterday? They just reissued a statement saying that people need to wear masks. And at the same time, Jersey's governor was like, eh, we're good. <laughs> we're we're going to roll the dice and see what common happens. We'll prevail. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because common sense has been the driving force this entire time. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah it's absolutely obvious that it has been. So Yeah. yeah. Um, so just real, I mean, I know you, you've been, uh, keeping a breath, more abreast. I feel like even than me, cause I, I've, I've sent you stuff and you're like, ha ha, I see, I see your information and I raise you, um, <laughs> yeah, you're like, <laughs> I raise you a peer reviewed study I've been working on. Oh, wow. Uh, that's, you got me beat. You've um, been doing a great job though. I mean, you know, the, the one part of the issue too, is that a lot of people out there kind of head stuck in sand, right? Mm -hmm. It just feels as though I want to get back to normal or whatever that is to people. Yeah. I don't want to see this anymore. And uh, right. we're really not in a position to take that. Well, you could take any stance you want, but we're not really. <laughs> oh, that that's going to really work out well for us. So right. I applaud you because you're not doing any of that. I think, yeah, it doesn't matter. That's, I, you know, I wish it, it made a difference, but it doesn't because Diane and I talk about it all the time too. We're like, we can be as decent and, and try as hard as we possibly can to it do the right like thing. One person fighting yeah. the support <laughs> of non believers. Yeah, exactly. And then you're just fucked. So you're like, oh, okay, I guess it doesn't matter. But yeah, it is, it is really frustrating. And that's the other thing I wanted to touch on that we are going to talk about too is the kind of running gag of mental health issues that this country yeah. seems to have that. One, they're also ignoring, but like for like we we were talking a little bit about the the um, I think the imbalance between the people that are um, struggling with their mental health because they're not acknowledging the situation that's going on. And then there's us who are like, doesn't anybody see what's fucking going on? And we're dealing with our own mental health in that respect, too. So um, yeah, I was I was telling you about this show that I watched called The Leftovers. Um, oh, yeah. And it's a really, really interesting Good. show. And uh, it's to me, it's like it's basically a, I mean, it's sort of a combination of sort of like 9-11 meets COVID, um, but then has a lot of like COVID sort of overlays in terms of, you know, the huge group of people that kind of want to just legitimately get back to normal and right. just that's live and be out there doing it. And then you have this very narrow, tiny group of people that are basically just saying, we're not, we're not gonna, you know, let you <laughs> stop remembering what happened. And I mean, you know, there, you could say there's sort of, I mean, in between is probably where it would be nice for most of us to fall, mm -hmm. um, where, you know, you're not so rigidly tied to what happened that you can't move past it. Um, and yet you're not so rigidly tied to just forgetting about it that you don't even remember that it happened or existed. Right. Um, so it's nice if some of us fell sort of more in the middle somewhere. Um, but it does feel like we're starting to get to these sort of 
you know, opposite ends of the pendulum. And uh, a lot of people just really kind of want to not remember at all what right. happens or what's happening. Yeah. And they get angry about it, too, which is another thing that's really infuriating, too, because even if you like just try to bring it up or be like, hey, maybe this event's not such a good idea. They're like, fuck you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, one side definitely thinks the other is crazy. Like, yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's tough. It's not, I mean, you know, one of the things that I do study and I do research on is how to communicate with people, either if you are one of the people that wants to go back to 2019, which by the way, I always say 2019 had some issues. <laughs> yeah. There were some issues with the people in 2019. Everybody wasn't like, you know, walking through the daffodils and having a great time, you know, with the rainbows, right? Like it right. Was for a lot of people in 2019 but some people want to go back there and they remember it being the best thing ever um and so somewhere in between that and then the people who are really sort of very vociferous about oh, i really want people to deal with this there's ways that people can communicate but we're not really doing much of that no yeah you're absolutely right but where are we currently right now because there's three because i got i told you i got sick and i mm -hmm. diana was going through the same stuff mm -hmm. um and I still like I didn't get COVID or anything like that. And I didn't get the flu. And apparently I didn't get RSV. But whatever I did get mm. floored me. And I'm still having like issues just at night, mostly uh, coughing or whatever. And I feel I like you still my... have like a cough. Yeah. Dealing with. Oh, really? And, yeah. And I got tested for all of those things. Two different kinds of flus. Yeah. And strep. You know, yes, <laughs> like, yeah. what it is. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, so the 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 main culprits, you know, seasonal flu, RSV, and then well, the we'll talk about this, but the the myriad of COVID variants. So you got that. Then there's just other things that just sort of like float out there that you know don't necessarily come up on a panel when you get tested. Or we're so busy dealing with these other issues that uh, you know sort of unclear what they are. Just viruses and other things that are sort of in the stratosphere. Though, so those are there. Um, and you know, in in normal years, we don't think about it very much because uh, you know, oh, I got a stomach bug, or oh, I mean, how often do people used to say that back in the day? Mm -hmm. Right. Day three, or I got a stomach bug, or I got a whatever. It's probably the flu. But now yeah. we're hyper vigilant, right? So now you're, well, it's got to be one of these three things. And if it's not, I've got, you know, dengue fever or malaria. <laughs> or... <laughs> yeah. you know? um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I think, again, we've all become a little bit more aware of what things could be. And when you have certain symptomatology that looks like COVID, that's mm -hmm. where your mind goes. And if yeah. it's not that, you're, you're kind of thinking, you know, one or two other things. Um, so Yeah. And I mean, John and I, like, we are both pretty vigilant, but we were at the same place and not masked up. Yeah. You know, like you were wearing a mask sometimes, but like, right. I should have, I should have done it. Like, yeah. And it, it was one of those things that like, I don't know. I mean, you know, I mean, people, people kind of know, but like my dad passed away and we went to a funeral and it was a whole thing. And I'd spent so much time in and out of Brooklyn and like dealing with that kind of stuff in my mind. I don't know why I didn't think anybody was going to have or get sick, but I, you know, it, you, you slip up in those moments. And even if you are wearing a mask, like half or, or whatever it is, it takes a second. And I know like, you know, it is easy to fuck up, but it was one of those things that like, I what concerns me is I'm a pretty healthy person and like we're, we're I mean, we're all like we're none of us are old. You know what I mean? But like, yeah. you know, I'm, you know, getting there. But like, I don't feel like I'm old enough where a fucking virus has to knock me out for over a month. And I'm like, is this is this now the new I hate to say it new normal or whatever it is. But really, is that what it's going to be like? Am I never going to be? able to fucking battle this shit off and are like because we've talked about it before too my thing is is that are we just going to eventually all die because we were exposed to covid and some dumb fucking illness that could have been you know over with within a week is going to wipe us out i mean that's that you know as a public health person those are the kind of things that kind of make me very concerned right because i i think what people thought about COVID in the beginning, and I, I'm I'm hard pressed to think people still think this, but I'm sure they do, um, was that oh well you get COVID once or twice, but you get over it and then right. you move along. But I mean I 
I know more than one person that has, has had COVID four or five times. And so one would have to start, even the most sort of uh, optimistic person would have to start saying to themselves, I would think, well, what is that doing to my immune system? And then when yeah. whatever else comes along, um, what will that look like for me? And so, you know, there's starting to be some interesting research out there about multiple COVID infections um, and what that does to people and their immune systems. Um, also, your chances of getting long COVID, which we can talk about that. Um, and, you know, your chances of getting long COVID, uh, the more times you get COVID. And so now we're starting to paint a picture which goes to what you're talking about, where yeah, if I have COVID five, six, seven times, um, and I start to get this non-COVID symptomatology, and I'm also starting to just sort of be unable to ward off sort of basic um, infections, what kind of picture is that setting up for me as I get older in life? And it's, and it's not anything that anybody really wants to sort of say is uh, something they would want, I wouldn't think. And it's right. paint a particularly pleasant picture. So these are all things that I would imagine people would be concerned about, but it doesn't, it, it, you get the sense that not as many people are concerned about it as there should be. I, yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. And it like, I don't want to be that guy who's super paranoid about shit. I am completely like, uh, you, you know, I'm a bit of a hypochondriac when it comes to certain shit, but I think I'm reasonable about it. But the thing is, it's like all these deaths, all the like younger people that are that are dropping over dead because they had something or whatever. Like I'm I'm not going to go full blown conspiracy, but I am kind of curious, like what were their lungs like after covid? What was their heart like after covid? What was how bad of a case of covid did they have? Like, isn't this getting into the point where it's like I read somewhere that the the um, they're having a hard time differentiating covid and HIV now because the T cells are so low. Is that a thing that I that I'm like? I had heard that, and I actually wrote that down as one of the um, things to continue to watch and research. Um, I think that that's another one of these things that we need more research about. Okay. But it's things are starting to get concerning. Um, you know, I mean, COVID, HIV. The flu, these are all viruses, right? And yeah. uh, they're all very different in terms of how they manifest and what they do and how they do it. Uh, but as you've heard me talk about before, I mean, I think the, um, <laughs> whatever, the the Babe Ruth and Keith Hernandez and <laughs> right. um, whoever else of, of viruses is uh, herpes zoster, aka chickenpox, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it's an, it's an, I hate to sound like this, but I'm a public health person. But it's a pretty like incredible virus in terms of how it functions, whereby you get infected, you have chicken pox, and then 50 years later, you're minding your own business, uh, you know, maybe <laughs> at the shopping mall or whatever, you start to get some pain on your face, boom, you have yeah. shit, right? right? And so when we think about, I mean, just think about a virus that just sits in your body for it's in it's hanging out, waiting for a monster. Moment, you know, yeah. you might not write a sci-fi right? mo like <laughs> sci-fi movie yeah, like that. Exactly. I mean, that's right. so scary. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I mean, I think these are the you we should start thinking in those kind of terms, in terms of, you know, are we dealing with something that kind of just sort of sits? Sure. And hangs out for decades and will manifest in some other way. Right. 20 years. Wait, wait, we, we, I mean, we don't know. And anybody yeah. who says they do know, um, I like to see their peer reviewed research. <laughs> <laughs> can I, can I say something that's crazy about the public response is that the RSV thing that's going around. When I hear people talk about that, I wish they talked about COVID the way they talk about RSV. <laughs> because when I, when I was sick, they're like, you know what you have, you got to be careful about RSV. And I'm like, you mother fucker. <laughs> It's like, <laughs> like, the same like I, yeah, right. I'm like, if I, if I fucking could, like, if I, you know, if if you were that vigilant about the other thing, but they, they don't, you know, they still think the one is a fucking, uh, uh, you know, a hoax, and the other shit is, oh, you got, you got RSV. That's bad. That's a bad one. Is it? I, I think <laughs> it's, and that this is this is a thing that I think, you know, I you're thankful for this, but I think this is the thing that sort of like just tipped COVID in the in the wrong direction. 
for people mentally. You know, the whole children are infected by COVID. I guarantee uh, you, if COVID had been one of these diseases where like little Timmy and little Johnny and little Susie were getting sick and they were like four and five years old from the beginning, there would have been a very, very, very different reaction in this country. And again, I think it also speaks to like, you know, populations that are underserved and underrepresented and who we care for and who we <laughs> who we pay attention to and who we don't. And I guess if you're, you know, 93 in this country and something happens to you, well, yeah. oh well. Um, but if you're three years old, that's very different. So I think one thing out the gate that made COVID very different and very unusual um, was that it appeared it appeared in the beginning to not have the impact on children that other things do right like sure. chicken box and well, RSV. Like, so part of, like yeah. the cognitive dissonance is also like it's a moving target we're learning thing new things all the time you're learning new things all the time but because like people can't grasp it as like oh this is this forever like mm -hmm. they just want to put it in a box and leave it there and that's like that's not how science works <laughs> I, wish I, could science bottle, I really wish i could bottle what you just said and just like take it around with me maybe have a little bubble over my head or something and just point to it or so forth <laughs> we'll clip it yeah let's clip it. let's clip it let's do that okay because what you just said is the takeaway i'm not sure why i why people which by the way in 2020 we didn't even know anything about covid so it's mm. not like we had some great knowledge right. and now we're demystifying it i mean right. what did we know about covid in march of 2020 like not a whole lot i mean we knew it was a virus kind of knew the mechanism by which it was transmitted but mm. in terms of everything else it was pretty opaque so for yeah. people to say like oh we were lied to people lied it's like well okay what do we know about it it's right. you kind of have to have knowledge in order to lie so mm. you have to know that <laughs> two plus two equals four and then when you say it equals five and it's a lie then you're lying to somebody but if you don't know what two plus two equals well then you're not you're not lying because you have no idea. And so I just love what you said, because to me, that that is the takeaway that there is no even now what we know about long COVID. That's not in a box that we open up and say that's long COVID right. or even a box that says that's COVID. We're learning. It's mm -hmm. a journey that's scary for a lot of people. Yeah. Right. And the other thing, too, is we have no leadership or real leadership around this, too. It always reminds me of like the uh, Occupy Wall Street shit back in the day where they would be like, there's no one person that tells us what to do. And you're like, somebody's got to fucking say something <laughs> like like somebody step up for the love of God, you know, and you got like Fauci, you got whatever. But you've got all these other factions that have these massive followings, you know, that are purporting different things or whatever, because I feel like when I talk to you know, older people about it, anybody's parents or maybe or like a little skeptical of it. It's not that they don't care about it, but they're like, I do not have a bunch of time left probably. Um, and I don't want to spend any more of it inside, which you kind of like, you're like, yeah, I, I kind of get it. Or, but if I feel like if they had some guidance, they could be like, okay, but there's a workaround. You don't have to stay inside. You don't have to fucking go out full blazed and, and just chance getting it and then ruining your life or somebody else's life. But there's a happy medium where you can spend being as safe as humanly possible and still live your fucking life, especially now. But like it, but there was no clear message back then. And it was a, it was a pain in the ass. And even now there's like, did you see the interview with Bill Maher and Richard Dawkins? I don't think so. Did Not I? worth your time, but I will <laughs> condense it for you. Uh, <laughs> um, because because and I, I'm a, I was a, you know, as a standup, you know, and maybe back in the day, I'm a big Bill. I love Bill Maher. I, I really like he got, you know, he was he was, you know, he had a couple really decent specials and now he's gotten a little bit more Andy Rooney and less, you know, whatever. So he's got Richard Dawkins on his podcast and I just Dawkins kind of gave up like when he was talking about vaccine shit because Bill Maher is like this you know, he, he tries to blur the lines where he's like, I'm not anti-vaccine. He goes, but I am anti-COVID vaccine because, so it's just dumb shit. And Dawkins is basically trying to explain to him, like, yeah, if we had just done our job, like if everybody had just gotten the vaccine, it would have had nowhere to go and it couldn't have, yada, yada, yada. And P P Bill Mars, like, like, and this sucks because this is a guy with millions and millions of, of, you know, 
of followers and views. Same thing as like a Rogan, same thing as everything else. But you saw Dawkins just kind of sit back and go like, fuck it. <laughs> like there's there's no there's no point and i i don't know is that your feeling because you're you're you know you've been communicating this for a while i don't know how you continue to do it and not be like fuck this shit but like you know yeah exactly yeah you are but like when you're met with somebody like that because we've been we've had we've had people you know who've uh we've talked to who who don't you know completely agree whatever are you just like, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, everybody for themselves. I'm going to be fine. <laughs> you well, know? Because, because that, that right there is you've kind of identified what the issue is. I mean, the difference. So it's really interesting because, um, Oh, well, hi, Jack, Jackie. Um, uh, that's smart. That's great. I, you're the issue that you identified is the reason why I went into public health in the first place. And you know, the definition of public health is balancing um, people's civil liberty interest um, with the ability of the government to be able to <laughs> balance those civil liberty interests right. as it relates to the health of the public, right? And there's mm -hmm. something called police power that you've heard me talk about in this old timey case, Jacobson v. Massachusetts, that involves a guy named Jacobson that didn't want to get smallpox vaccination in 1905 and mm -hmm. well, in 1897, and then 1905 was the case. Right. Um, and so that basically is public health. I wish we could be in a space where we would say every person for themselves. And, you know, up until COVID, public health as a discipline had a little bit started to go into that direction. So we were mm -hmm. really focusing on things like seatbelt laws and helmet laws and soda. Remember soda bans? Remember oh, that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. But so I you, do remember the soda ban. <laughs> you have another nice swig right. on that. Let me tell you something about the soda ban. <laughs> Get it, go ahead. So the soda ban, if you compare the soda ban with COVID mandates, it mm -hmm. seems so quaint now because soda bans <laughs> are really about like you, what you're ingesting into your right. body. It right. really have any sort of impact on me. I mean, you know, maybe 40 years from now when I have to pay yeah. for it and then fill in the blank, that's an issue. But it doesn't have an impact on me. So public health as a profession had really sort of like started to look at some of these, I would say very sort of personal type choices that people were making in walks, you know, the <laughs> not so hero hero of the story, COVID. And right. now we're right back to, you know, where public health's roots are. And so, I mean, that's why I went into public health because you, you really can't sort of take this tact that I'm going to just sort of look out my mouth. And the the other, the final thing I'll say about that is I just heard this really great quote, um, which was, um, basically, to paraphrase, it was that society succeeds when, you know, the older person plants a tree knowing that they will never sit in the shade. Oh, yes. Right? And so and it's a really great quote because, you know, the, 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 the theory behind that is and it's public health is we do things not because they will benefit us, but because they will benefit others in ways that they will never benefit us. And if society does that and has that philosophy, we all succeed. And I would say that's where we've missed the boat with COVID because a lot of people are saying, oh, what's in it for me? What about me? I need to hug my this person and hang out with my that person. But that doesn't really help your fellow person if you have COVID and you you give it to them and all <clears> of their relatives. Right. So I think a little bit more of planting a tree that you will never be able to sit under the shade is what we need more of. Yeah. Yeah. And we were talking about, I don't remember her name, but the girl from uh, Wednesday who said that yeah. she went and did that, did that dance scene with all those extras there knowing she may have had COVID and they were waiting. But her language while she was talking about it was, yeah, we were trying to be safe. I got a COVID test and we were waiting on the results while I did the scene. It's like, how is that fucking safe? Like right. you should have not been out there until you got it back. And she had COVID. Yeah, and I think the other interesting thing about that, too, and this goes to messaging, right? Mm -hmm. um, and sort of this notion that, uh, like, how we say things and how we say them about COVID, um, it can be very influential on how other people take them. So even thinking about that kind of messaging and thinking about how will that come across to, I mean, that show has... 
I was looking and it, it apparently was like the it's like the third streamed show on Netflix behind uh, the that <laughs> I you can see I don't watch Netflix, but uh, <laughs> behind like two other shows um, that Stranger Stranger kind of, but it's a very 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 popular show, and uh, so to think that <clears throat> that messaging is out there, um, that's problematic I would say so I would just say something like that you know a show like that and you know somebody who has that kind of access how are you framing your behavior after it's done what messaging are you putting out there and I think that could have been a moment where a very different message could have been put out to people all right so what do you, but what do you say to people who say because there's a, there's a lot of people who are also very influential who kind of say the stuff who kind of say stuff like, uh, if you're young and you're healthy, you don't have to worry about it. If you're young and you're healthy, you don't have to get the vaccine if you're young and you're healthy. Other other than, you know, the fact that you can transmit it to somebody else and then spread it and then it can mutate. Because I don't think anybody cares about it. We're, we're beyond the point of anybody caring about anybody else. But is there any truth to the idea that your immune system can handle any of this shit? Um, well, I mean, I would say... <laughs> we've got a long COVID problem, right? So right. yes, you, your, your immune system can, but the re the most recent stats in New York City are that upwards of 30% of all people that had COVID had long COVID symptoms. So, right. you know, you tell me, I mean, I would say, yes, your immune system can handle it in so much as you don't die. <laughs> um, but if you have long COVID Yet. for 12 months, 24 months, 26 months or longer, right. then I would say your immune system has uh, suffered a, um, a damage effect. Let's put right. that in. So that's challenging. Good God. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I know. It gets, this about that. I mean, like, there's a lot of health professionals, like my parents and my sister are all in the, all nurses. So like, um, Lord only knows how many times they've gotten COVID the past however many years and like how that is going to ultimately affect them in the future. Like, we just don't know yet. Right. <laughs> We yeah. don't know. And again, you're, you're on it, right? We don't know. And there's no reason why we would know necessarily 2.9 years into this. Actually, we're coming up on three years. It's like Ooh. in a couple of weeks, really. Um, so three years in, there's really no reason why we would know. And yet people think we should know. And again, I guess maybe because I'm a, an old timey public health person, and just, I mean, I know how public health works. You don't get mm -hmm. answers in just, boom, a year or two years or three years right. or 10 years. I mean, again, look at HIV. We've been dealing with HIV for a long time. Um, yeah. So to me, I, I, I look at COVID and think to myself from a public health perspective, wow, things are moving pretty fast. Like we're, yeah. you know, you kind of throwing everything at it and we're getting some really good information. But I, I mean, I, I can only assume that other people look at it and they're thinking this is super slow. And I find that fascinating as a public health person. Um, but we don't have the answers. We may not have them for a long time. And that's right. I, decently disconcerting to people. Honestly, I get there's it. a lot of people who don't like how fast it's gone, who are right. suspicious of how fast it's gone. And like, I can't even right. deal with that. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Right. No. Absolutely. Well, I mean, the whole sort of like um, warp speed business, and um, you know, people kind of feeling like um, there it's just going too fast. Yeah, you're right. That's sort of like the opposite issue. You're absolutely right. Yeah, Heather, you're coming yeah. in a little choppy on my end. Do you want to log back in and out again, real quick? Yes, I think I actually know why I might be because. Um, oh, okay. It it <clears throat> when you when you plug in your computer oh <laughs> 1%. yeah your computer is slowly dying and like chugging away it's like as jackie in the chat is asking if heather has an instagram 
by the way. Oh, yeah. Heather, exactly. plug your I'm like, <clears throat> Nice. I, you know what's funny? Hopefully, I'll be a little less laggy in a second. Oh, yeah. I own private Instagram, but I have a nonprofit that I run. See, now I feel like I'm less laggy, right? Yeah, you're less laggy. Yeah, you're, <laughs> little, you're a little behind, but it's coming back in. Electricity helps every time. I'm looking at myself I'm like, I look really laggy. And I was like, oh, look at that. 1% battery life. Um, so uh, I don't. <laughs> um, I don't I don't have my own personal Instagram. I got to work on that. I do have a Twitter though. But I mean, you know, who knows how long that'll stick around. Um, I mean, not really today. Obvious, you know, but I do have a I have a nonprofit called Help for Youth and uh I actually do post like COVID things on there. Um I uh I do um some writing for various like news outlets and uh so you can follow me there and I'm Heather M. Butts on uh, Twitter. And I really yeah. appreciate you asking that question. Yeah, we'll have it. We'll, I should, if I knew what, what I was doing, I would have a little scroll down at the bottom that had your uh, information on it, but I don't. Uh, <laughs> I'll learn all this stuff eventually. It's only been two years since we've been doing this. Uh, <laughs> I just I just sit. Um, yeah, I, I, recent, I just deleted my Twitter today. Did you? Gone. Did you you're, you're out. You're gone. You're done. I couldn't. I'm proud of you. <laughs> thank you. I really couldn't. I logged in and then I just saw Musk tweeting and then like Lauren Bur Bobert, who I don't follow, was also on my feed for some reason. And I was like, I cannot. I can't do it anymore. Like nobody I wanted to speak to was on my like, you know, like and, and it's just so kind of fucked up and choppy and it was kind of aggravating. And I was like, I really don't need to be here. And like, I wish I had like major influence the way celebrities do because here's the thing that drives me crazy like all these like you know uh celebrities with millions of followers are like complaining and bitching about twitter and elon musk and i'm like okay but the only reason why three point something million people are on twitter is they're your followers and they're following you so abandon fucking ship go somewhere else and then you know uh like like don't don't give the company the money that's the only that's the only way to do it right but they don't want to lose that thing and they're pretending they're in this like years from now we're going to be talking about world war ii and then the great celebrity twitter war they had with elon musk like as if it's an equal you know and it's like no it doesn't matter it's stupid right yeah but i don't know yeah. anyway that's my feeling on it you should go follow heather on twitter though that was my point <laughs> <laughs> she's still and there can help for you. So I'm there. I do actually post about like COVID updates, especially for, um, you know, like the young people that, uh, that we work with because we, the nonprofit does a lot of work with the underserved youth and there's a huge mm. issue around like access to COVID care and, yeah. um, all of it around, uh, for young people. I actually did this really interesting presentation a couple of months ago around, um, unhoused youth during COVID. Now wrap your head around that. Think about if you're like 17, you've got nowhere to live at the height of COVID when people were creating their bubbles, where you would go. So, so, so think about being unhoused at like 17 and you're trying to find a place to live and you're, you, you normally couch surf and then boom, these bubbles pop up and people are like, I'm sorry. Like we have a family bubble. I would can't take you in now. Right. So um, a lot of our time during COVID was uh, to be able to do that kind of work to figure out how to help young people that, um, you know, uh, did not have a home, young people who were aging out of foster care, all of those young people that didn't have somewhere to live, young people who were court involved and might have been in the juvenile system. So we had were, I mean, again, I always feel like with the nonprofit that I do, it was like that was our moment. Like that was the reason why I created the nonprofit was for COVID. I felt yeah. like this is the moment, like not the last X number of years. This is it. COVID right. right here. And so, um, so yeah, so we still keep up with, you know, information and so forth and, you know, issues around mental health and so forth. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. What, what is the, so like what you just talked about with your nonprofit and stuff. And then I think what we've talked about before with like the, I guess the, the first responders of COVID, which are the essential employees, the people who like wound up having to work during all this shit and then getting it, getting the first strain of COVID first. Is there any kind of legal action that anybody in the country can have where if they do wind up getting sick, like the I think we talked about it before, but like about like the 9-11 first responders, how this Droga bill and all that other stuff had happened before. 
you know, they just wound up getting them coverage for it. But like, what if years later, all these young people wind up having like these crazy ass symptoms? Is there any legal kind of action that people can take or no? So I've thought about this. So COVID is tough because <laughs> since people are whipping off their masks and going out doing whatever, mm -hmm. you know, the thing about the thing about um the thing about the law is, you know, you need a causal connection. So so what what would the cause of action be? It'd be some sort of what's called a tort. Um probably maybe negligence, right? So negligence, duty breach, cause damages. There's a duty somebody <laughs> has to someone else that right. has been breached. Now the third one's key. There's a causal connection between the breach and then fourth, the damages that the person suffers. So the last two things are the thing that would be hard for COVID. One, you'd have to prove, you know, it was specifically my being in the hospital that was the reason why I got COVID and the damages were huge. Now, obviously, if you got COVID and died, well, your family would say, yeah, that's pretty substantial. But the problem is because we have so many people who, you know, kind of were out and about, or even like with a lot of first responders, they weren't, they like did their job and they went home. So mm -hmm. you would say, okay, but they weren't out and about, but guess what? Their family members were, right? So their right. family members were out there doing whatever they were doing, coming home. And at, at the height of COVID, do you know the percentage of people who got COVID because somebody brought it into the house? Do you know what that percentage was? No, what? Over 60%. Oh, the vast shit. majority of people wow. were getting COVID, not because they left their house. They were getting it because they were like <clears> hunkered <throat> down in their house Somebody brought COVID into their house and they got COVID. That's why it's usually like a lot of these people that are sort of like living by themselves and stuff. They're like, I've never had COVID. <laughs> like, <laughs> we don't have some people coming in, you know, after like a rager in that story. I always joke with my students, they're like, don't be that person who's in Long Island City at 4 a.m. with the lampshade on their head, partying the night away in the middle of COVID. Don't be that person. Okay. 100% agree. Right. So, but there are those people, right? So that's those people. Then they go home and then they have COVID and they give it to the household. So the problem with the, the first responder proving that they got COVID specifically from their workplace is after they left their workplace, they got on the subway or they had to take, you know, other transportation or they were in a household with, you know, their teenager who was dancing the night away in Long Island City. So it becomes hard to create the causal connection between the fact that I was at work and I got it there and then the damages, I mean, long COVID, maybe now. Yeah. To be. But for most people, you know, the minimizing of COVID, oh, it's just like having a cold. Um, what are your damages? Um, that also becomes a little more challenging. And now we've got people that are, you know, three, four, five bouts of COVID. How right. do you then prove which bout of COVID you had <laughs> that was a thing that led to some damaging long COVID or was it cumulative? And right. which was then you'd have almost sort of like a comparative negligence kind of argument, which is, well, the hospital was 10% negligent and uh, <laughs> Uzi dancing the night away and Astoria Long Island right. was 40% negligent, you know, and then you sort of like would have to make this mishmash of like a pizza pie. <laughs> yeah. Well, couldn't you say if the government had done its job properly, they wouldn't have had to work during COVID? Like, you know what I mean? Like some people got to stay home and some people had to work, but if the government's response was quicker and they didn't hand checks out every quarter century, you know, we would have had, we, we'd have had to do it. Like, isn't that, a, isn't that a good argument? Yeah, that's an interesting argument. My <laughs> comment to that would be, um, there, there's a lot of spaces that I think we could look at um, what did or did not happen or what the government did or did not do or what other entities did or did not do. But now we're going so long into this that now we have sort of new sets of problems um, within yeah. like, it's rough. It's rough. What were you gonna say? I now? was just gonna say, like, that's a lot to unpack. I yeah. mean, there's a lot to unpack there because it it's exactly what Heather's saying. Like there it's we're building one problem on top of another, on top of another, on top of yep. another. So it's like it, especially in the public health field, like forget it. Like there's so much to unpack there. Um, talking about uh, people who have addiction problems, who are out on the streets during COVID, like that's 
another public health concern and like unhoused people for sure. But like no one, it's like an unglamorous cause. So yeah. no yeah. one wants to pitch in for that. Ooh. Even though us as a society as a whole are going to benefit from it tenfold, mm -hmm. like no one wants to start at the beginning. <laughs> like yeah, no, nobody. You're absolutely right. I mean, again, you're just you're you 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 could live your best life as a public health person. I, oh, I get no. it. Because, <laughs> you're 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 on it. I mean, you know, a huge issue I would say too. And I this is like my mantra that I'm going to say. And I know John has heard me say it before. How you enter COVID is how you are experiencing COVID. Mm -hmm. So if you enter COVID and you were in foster care and unhoused and uh, had mental health issues and also, uh, you know, had an opiate addiction. Well, guess what? COVID didn't make any of that better for you, right? So right. all of that was exacerbated, including the mental health issue, by the way, which <clears throat> there's a lot of research now that there is, for some people, there's a long COVID uh, connection between how they enter COVID with their mental health issues, anxiety, PTSD, depression, and then how they experience COVID and 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 long COVID. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of interesting. But none of that was made better for people. And again, you know, in this country, we have an unfortunate relationship with dealing with problems at a at sort of their systemic space, right? Yeah. Um, not sort of just sort of like covering them over, but actually really dealing with them. And so if we had that problem before COVID and we, we had, I mean, we had an opioid problem before COVID that was, you know, very much bubbling to the surface. Well, the, you know, the, now that you have people that can't get the services they need and can't get the interventions they need um, and now have their own anxiety and depression and trauma, that's all just going to get exacerbated. So these are things we, we've not dealt with before COVID, sure. I, I'm not sure why anybody would think that we would deal with them during or whenever the after of COVID is. It's not now, by the way, people. Not now. <laughs> <laughs> when the after happens, which is not now. Um, how would, how would, why would we think that? So, yes, and I agree with you 100%. Absolutely. I just don't want us to become a fucking Newsweek cover where it's like generation sick. And then it's like, you know, five years fucking later. And they're like, what happened? I'm like, well, I'll tell you what happened. I know. I mean <laughs> I, I was there. <laughs> I you know it's interesting you said it because I like in my mind, I feel like we are like when when the history when the history books are written and see by the way, that's why in my mind I keep saying to myself, like whatever little piece of this planet I'm on and whoever might like read a little tiny thing about me in the future, which mm -hmm. you know, probably be some dusty old little <laughs> whatever, and they're like, oh this other butts human being that lived you know 800 years ago right um i, I i'm i'm trying to get, you know keep my stuff like you know <laughs> yeah like you're like your social media presence where you know oh i'm just helping people and giving food away and oh. that's me, like just do gooder <laughs> yeah i i mean because when when the history books are written um we will be we will be judged by I think by how each of us individually and collectively um, saw COVID through. Yeah. And I think about that a lot. I definitely think we will, I don't know what our moniker is going to be, whether it's generation sick or generation COVID or generation whatever it is, mm -hmm. but I think we're going to get one. And, you know, when you think about what, what, what your footprint is on this time and um, how you will be looked back on what 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 is that are you are yeah. you proud of how you have you know dealt during this time do you have a sense of i've helped other people and um you know i'm not made it about myself do you, do you have that sense um if you don't maybe you want to reflect on that and what that looks like um so i do think about that a lot i do mm -hmm. And what, so let's talk about the mental health stuff a little bit too, because yeah. like you said, everyone's been dealing with it beforehand and we're going into it. Whatever article that was just out recently that was talking about um, like everybody, like the, like the country's in a mental health crisis and like half of the country's not acknowledging that they're in a mental health crisis and the other half is going deeper into their mental health because they're like, is no one else seeing that? Like it's, it's insane. Cause I feel like, I think we all feel like is no one else seeing this. Like, obviously we're all, way deeper into this mess 
you know, in our own heads than we were beforehand. And then I think it's even more frustrating to see people just kind of going about their fucking day and their lives, you know, which like, like it, it, but it is, it is frustrating. Are we going to be able to dig ourselves out of it at any point or no? The mental health piece? Yeah. Um. And how? It's a great question. I think it will be challenging um, because we weren't able to really dig ourselves out of it before. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So again, I just think a lot of these things get exacerbated. They just get worsened by the stressors of a global pandemic. Um, you know, the one the one silver lining I will say is um, telehealth, telemedicine. And the fact that there are, you know, whole groups of people for whom mental health and um, psychiatry, psychology, psychological interventions were um, precluded from them just because mm -hmm. maybe they were too far away or they didn't have the means or they uh, didn't want to physically go somewhere or they had too much going on. And so there is a, a an opening, a window for some people who heretofore could not avail themselves of mental health services and now through um you know the ability to do something similar to this with HIPAA regulations being in place they can so I think that's sort of like an interesting sort of um kind of like side note to this it's not a side note actually it's sort of like the note um <laughs> in terms of what that will look like um but in terms of can we sort of I mean I I, I Again, COVID is not over. The pandemic right. is not over. There's a whole lot of people. I mean, I feel like it's going to be like, you know, some sort of a zombie movie. There's a whole lot of people that like when it really gets done are going to be like coming out of wherever because yeah. they've been holding up for like three, four, five years. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be like, where have you been? And <laughs> with you, you you all right? You okay? You okay? Like, I wish like, that was me. Okay. So I mean, that's that's the thing that I always think about is there's people we just haven't heard from. Yeah, like, we don't know what's going on with them, or if we've heard from them, it's not in a way that we really have a good handle on what's going on with them. Now that would be very interesting once mm -hmm. we once we uncover the dust. So I think it's going to be challenging. And I, again, kind of like to Diane's point, I don't think we know the full scope of the COVID impact from right. a physical perspective, and definitely from a mental health perspective. Well, how are you doing? Oh, me, mental health wise. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm good. I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like I'm oh, so... Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I hate to you. be that person. Um, But I mean, I'm good. I'm not, you know, the thing about me is too, is um, I am not... So number one, I'm not a mega extrovert at all. I'm not an extrovert. <laughs> We've had this time. <laughs> I'm not an extrovert, right? So, and I also, um, I don't draw my energy from like, physically being around people. I think people who do that are struggling a lot mm. around COVID. And I think another thing too is my sort of like interactions with the world are on sort of like a very like ethereal kind of plane. Um, you know, I'm not one of these people that like has to like sit with people and like feel their energy and like <laughs> in the face. I that's not my right. that's not my none of that is me. Right. I think all of those people are the ones who are like really struggling. Yeah. So that's, I mean, you know, there was a point where when COVID, like I'd say like two or three months into COVID and um, I, uh, you know, we were all on lockdown and I would um, at six o'clock every day, I would go for like a three mile walk, um, mm. you know, like from my um, home, just like in Queens. And it was just like quiet it was just like peaceful. And I just remember thinking to myself, like, this is awful and it's a tragic time. Um, but like this just silence, mm -hmm. I was like, I'll never see this again. Like, this Oh, yeah. You have to see the good in, I feel like, you know. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. It is. I yeah. enjoyed the fuck out of it in the beginning. I mean, this was <laughs> it, it, it was a real I, I don't know because I, I, you know. And I, I am, I think I am an extroverted person, but I think you are. Yes, you are. Yeah. I can't, <laughs> just a little, just a, I mean, just a smidge, yeah, but like, but I also didn't mind like the down or, or like, I didn't mind yeah. trying to recreate my extroversion within the constraints of whatever it was. Right. So like, I don't, I don't know why, but like, I was just like, Oh, like I can do this or I can talk to people on the phone or like talk to my friends. So like, that was okay. And then I think 
the cognitive dissonance of everybody like being like, we can fuck, fuck this. We can go out or whatever. Like that was annoying. Yeah. It was like, you know, that was hard for me. I got to I mean, I know I've said this to you before, but I have once again got to applaud you. You are one. And I've said this to you off the air. Uh. You are one of those people. When I think about a human being that should like if you looked up the word pivot in the dictionary, your face should be right there because <laughs> the ability for you to pivot like from from what was going on in pre COVID times to what mm. you're doing now. I'm in awe of it. And oh, I mean, nice. I really, I, I do wish that more people could a little, like I was having a really great conversation with one of my faculty um, colleagues about, uh, you know, Zoom and mm. teaching online. And we were both talking about like all these cool things that you can do. And if, you know, people could sort of like give into that a little bit and just sort of like be able to sit in that as opposed to just saying, I don't teach that way. That's not what I do. Right. Not, leave me alone. Um, then we could maybe start to think about something beyond the rig the rigidness of yeah. how we've always sort of done things. But I applaud you because um, what you have done and what you have created uh, is incredible. It really oh. is. And so, I, you know, for me personally, I mean, I'm doing really well. Like, I mean, I, one of the, again, I'm somebody who mentally, I pivot very easily. Sure. And I kind of just sort of, you know, and the, the, the thing, last thing I'll say about this is I don't have expectations from life. I say this to my students all the time, life owes you nothing. And so when you, <laughs> when you get something, you're happy. When you don't get anything, you're not disappointed. Right? Yes. So to me, life owes you nothing. So if you're sitting around waiting for life to go back to 2019 or waiting for whatever, mm -hmm. keep waiting because the, you're waiting for something that life does not owe you. And yeah. I think if you sort of like enter life, at least for me, with a sense of purpose and grace and lack of expectation, um, then what comes your way, you absorb and you take and you work with what you got. I mean, I think that's what fuels like your resilience, honestly, is like the work that you're doing must be so rewarding, mm -hmm. like knowing that what you're doing every single day is helping someone like, I like that to think so. huge. Absolutely. <laughs> I like to think so. But you know what? To your point, even if it helps one person, that's one person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so that's and one it's person more. And I'm glad you're doing well mentally because we need you to be yes. doing well mentally. Otherwise, if you were like, I am on a threat, I'd be like, <laughs> I'm hanging on by a thread. Yeah, I'd be like, oh, it's God. Just like this. I'm <laughs> if no, she's no, I, losing it. It's kind of the opposite. I mean, I, you know, yeah. like I said, I just, you know, I don't ever, I don't, I never had expectations about life like before COVID and then sure. when COVID happened, to be honest with you, I kind of, in my mind thought this is what I've been waiting. For. I mean, like this is what I've been preparing for. Not yeah, like, yeah. Oh, for, but like <laughs> my, you know, I like my whole career was to prepare for COVID. Yeah. I just never thought I'd see it. I thought I'd be dead right. long before any COVID happened. So I, so kind of like the analogy I gave about the older person and the tree. I always thought I was just planting things for the generation that would deal with a COVID. I yeah. didn't think I'd ever see it, but I thought if I can like put out enough sort of like good into the world and I can help enough people and I can prepare like my students that are, you know, 19 for the pandemic, maybe in like, you know, another 50 years, then I've done my part. Right. I, honestly, that's what I always thought. I never thought I would see a pandemic in my lifetime. I just thought I'll put some good stuff into the world. Hopefully I'll do what I can and I'll prepare the next generation or the next generation after the next generation for that. Yeah. And now that it's here, I feel like it's my duty to um, be a part of the change for good to help people deal with where we are. I wish we had more people Beautiful. like that. That would have been we would yeah, that was great. We would have been we would have been way less fucked if there were more you. <laughs> cloning cloning is not happening fast enough. You know what's crazy? I'm glad you course corrected. You said this is what you've been waiting for because if they're, they're gonna connect you to that lab leak theory real fucking quick. <laughs> you were like, not waiting, preparing. I'm like, all right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I have not been waiting for it. Definitely not. <laughs> it's, it's the thing that I it's my purpose yes. in life is this and people ask me that all like I get questions from people about like the work I do and I'm I'm always sort of like 
I mean, I say this sometimes. I'm like, do you know what I do? Like, do you, I'm right. a person. Like, do you, like, do you honestly understand what that is? People don't, by the way. No. We've been in COVID for three years now. There, there are still a host of people who just really don't understand COVID and public health at its most basic in right. terms of what a public health person is here to do. Admittedly, some of my colleagues, maybe they have questions about what yeah. maybe they're, you know, they're they're getting the first hand like look at it. But you know, what pub why you're here as a public health person is, you know, that's like a you know, a law enforcement friend of mine once said, you know, I get paid not for um what I have done, but what I might have to do. It's a firefighter type, right? Like sure. not for what I you know, do on a daily basis, but what I may have to do in those extraordinary circumstances. Right. And so, um, you know, you hope that you're ready for that. Yeah. Uh, I certainly trained for that. And I hope that what I'm putting out into the world um, manifests that training and I think the it does care that I have. So I appreciate that. One of the most infuriating things to me is literally when any, and I always say adult and I, and I know I'm an adult, but like, I don't feel like an adult, but when anybody like older than us is like, oh yeah, COVID man, what could we have done? And like literally the shit so you've been telling me. Yeah. Since I was a fucking child, which is the, like all the, all the pull yourself up by your bootstraps, people, all the fucking, you know, anytime you were young and questioned like the tax code or like work or, or, or the, or the bullshit hours you had to work or the inflation or anything like that. And they're like, that's just how life is. That's just the way shit is. You either got to, you know, you got to man up. You got to do all this kind of shit. All those people, as soon as COVID came around, they were like, I'm not going to fucking do any of that. <laughs> this is your time to shine. I thought you were the sacrifice generation. I thought you were the ones that like, you know, that that had to had to do with the impossible. And then they were like, as soon as this happened, like, you know, my generation is accused of being entitled all the time. was like, yeah, we'll wear masks. That's fine. Mm -hmm. And we'll do and we'll stay in and we'll do whatever we have to do. And they were like, you mean I got to stay inside with my family? <laughs> like, yes. are, are you the people telling us to have families like and you're not, you know, if, if you're in your late 30s and you're still single, you're a piece of shit. <laughs> Aren't those people the ones that like fucking, you know, you would have thought COVID would have been their time to shine, to show us up, to let us know I... what real sacrifice looks like. You bring up another interesting point because I got to tell you, um, certain people have surprised me and I don't get very surprised very often by people, but certain people have pleasantly surprised me in terms of how they have shined during COVID. And then other people who I would have thought would have been, you know, certain kinds of ways. Right. It's very interesting, right? And But that I think really tells you who people are, right? I right. mean, um, I think when you when you look back at the last three years and you think about either the people in your life or the people you've seen on TV or the you know officials that are out there, who are the people that are the standouts in terms of how they have led either personally or professionally yeah. or on the public stage? And who are the people who you're thinking to yourself, I'm I'm that is surprising that that is how you are comporting yourself. And um, it's just very interesting because again, that that's the measure of a person, right? Is yeah. uh, what they do in these times and what, and uh, how they, uh, how they function with their fellow human beings and totally. how they see their fellow human beings. So and Diane, I want to ask you, cause I know you, we're, we're people who always deal with mental health shit regardless, but do you, do you notice a shift in balance between old mental health you and post code can you differentiate between like this is now covid related and this is what i've always had mm. <laughs> like is there i feel like it through the lens of covid everything's fine <laughs> like honestly <laughs> like i woke up today i got to exercise like i have cats like it, it <laughs> made me like i just think you're yeah, so much more grateful yeah for simple things yeah yeah, but you're unique. I honestly want to say I think that that is a very unique perspective because I think so many more people look at COVID as what it's taken away from them and what they don't have anymore and what they can't do and what's not fair. It's not fair. It's not right. I can't do. And so I think the attitude that you've just expressed of gratitude um, is I, I, I mean, I hope it is more prevalent 
um, than it feels from all of what we hear sort of in the stratosphere. Um, I think a lot more people look at what they've lost um, around COVID than what they potentially have gained. And again, to me, that's perspective. Does life owe you something or is life this thing that's happening? And as it happens, you take it as it comes to you. I look at life in the latter. I definitely don't think it owes me anything. So I don't feel necessarily like there are, um, I mean, I think there are things that we all have lost, um, mm. but I don't look at it thinking that I was necessarily owed to keep them or yeah. owed to have them. Just grateful that I had these things when I had them. And now that I don't have them anymore, um, that is the, the way of life in the universe. Yeah. And so I think that your attitude is the one more of us need to have. Absolutely. And I love that. And other you're like, I have cats. I mean, come on. <laughs> Fucking. But yeah, I like that's I don't know. That's a really good point. And like some of the other things, too, is it made me appreciate like because uh, one of the things I definitely noticed during it is like I was joking around about people who are like, I have to spend time with my family. But it is kind of true where, you know, they have these caveats because when they were younger, they didn't bother to get to know themselves. And I don't mean like sit in a room and fucking um, meditate or whatever like that. But like people didn't have value outside of what their nine to fives were. Right. And then people didn't have it outside of outside of these checked boxes that they needed to make. Got to get married. Got to have kids. Got to have a house. Got to have a nine to five. And then it's like, well, who are you, though, without those things? There were so many people who did not know. And it made me feel pretty great that, like, you have to lose that kind of shit over time to figure out who you are. Like, so if you've never bothered to, like, take a risk, quit your job, get fired from you or, or any of that kind of shit, you don't know who you are. You just know what society wants you to be. And then when it's all taken away, these people went nuts. They were like, I need my Applebee's bar at nine because I don't know who I am. At this point in 2022, I hope like even those people have undergone like a perspective shift. Yeah. Nope. Like, nope. you know, <laughs> nope. really? because like, nope. I mean, maybe not those specific people, but like, I just think, how do you go nope. through that and not right. have it affect you in a deeper way? My, my my comment to that would be if it had, you wouldn't have so many people railing against having to sit at home, yeah. having to not go to Applebee's, having to, you wouldn't have so many people railing against that. Mm -hmm. um, now, again, admittedly, yes, there are certain things that um, people like to do, should be able to do civil liberties, freedom of movement, and so forth and so on. But I think the deeper question to ask is um, the, the why of that? Um, and what is it that makes people so enraged that they can't do those things? Yeah. Um, and I think once you start to peel that away, it gets to John's really interesting question in terms of, I mean, just something simple, like being able to just sit with yourself without anything else going on. No right. noise, no movies, no Netflix, no nothing. Yeah. You just do with you. And I think a lot of people had occasion to do that during COVID. And for some people, it was cathartic and a moment. And for other people, it was too much. It yeah. was- They were like, much. I hate me. Uh <laughs> <laughs> we're good. Like, if this yeah. is your shot to like- Yeah, fix it. Different. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think so I think experience that of like I don't really enjoy just sitting with me yes. just for myself that's a tough thing or who you're married with or to or, or whatever yeah. the situation is like there's so many people that like yeah. you know during COVID were like holy fucking shit this guy chews loud a lot 24 <laughs> 7 and I can't get him to stop I can't tell him to stop eating. I might kill him, you know, or whatever. You know, they don't... Well, he reads. I can't stand it. <laughs> yes, exactly. You're like, holy shit. There's a lot of stuff about this one human being, um, yeah. which, you know, which is eye opening, which I really wish like that's the thing that I think is the most disappointing about COVID is that we are not coming out of it um, a more educated like. Like, there's no, like, I was really, really, I mean, this is stupidly optimistic of me. <laughs> but in the beginning, I was like, man, the 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 180 we're going to do around 
nope. you know, business shit and fucking value of who we we there's a, there's people that just defaulted backwards immediately. I will tell you this though, the the in the in my little area, like in my little realm, again, some of the comedy clubs that are like these staples of like the industry, like businesses. I don't know if people ever experience it in in other business aspects or whatever, but without I just want to say it again, without the people, without without their staff, without the people that make that fucking building what it is, they're closing, they're folding. They have no fucking they've nothing to stand on. Mm. And they could they could paint it any way they want and say like, "Oh, you know, they can blame lack of whatever, but if you're not paying people livable wages and if you're not treating people right, you don't get to have a building." and 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 call it a uh you know a comedy club or, a, or whatever the fuck it is you don't get to do that kind of shit so i don't yeah, know it's a tug really, of war that's a really good point and i think those kind of things have happened during covid so i think there's certain sort of like institutional foundations that have mm. failed or have not been able to stabilize or have not been able to be sustainable because we had you know, people who were doing doing like the quiet quitting or doing the yeah. quitting, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so forth. So I think, you know, there were some people who sort of said to themselves, I, I don't want to do this anymore or I don't want to be in this anymore. And that made certain industries really sort of have to not, I don't say so much reflect. I think just sort of note that something had shifted for them such that they were no longer sustainable. Right. Um, you know, I too sort of thought maybe there would be more of a seismic change for people. Um, but I think we discount, um, you know. Politics. Uh, <laughs> well, and I think it's a resistance to change. change. Yeah. And, you know, a, a lot of just sort of like denial. Um, right. And that is, that is real. And again, I would say that with some of the mental health issues we are now seeing, you got a lot of people whose stuff has just been buried for a long time. A lot of people who have like traumatic childhoods and <clears> traumatic <throat> lessons and trauma all over the place, right? And their stuff has been buried for a very long time. Yeah. And now stuff is starting to just sort of like sort of kind of shake itself out from being buried because they've experienced something else that's very traumatic. COVID, COVID is going to inspire post-traumatic stress in a lot of people. In oh, lot yeah. Um, if well, it has already, let me ask you this. Cause I know we have to go to, and I want to ask you about the, the, um, the new shots and stuff, but I want to, before this, cause I know you dabble yeah. in the mental health stuff a lot too. Do you think, cause, cause we've talked, I think a little bit about like Twitter and all that other shit too, but like, as far as mental health goes and, mm -hmm. and the crisis in the country and people discovering like, you know, PTSD latent kind of, you know, uh, yeah. stuff they've been going through, so much trauma. I feel like because of the internet and because of social media, especially like Twitter, especially when, when the media tends to pick up on a smaller percentage of the population who might be dealing with mental health issues and makes it, you know, more mainstream. Do you think it affects the people who may not like, like you're like, like say you, you say you're doing pretty good, but mm -hmm. if you're constantly reading about how, the things that may make you happy or the, or, or the normal shit that's going on is somehow affecting a swath of the population that has mental health issues. Do you think that creates a larger issue of mental health? Because it's, I, I kind of, and I'm, this may not be making any sense yet because I haven't fully formed this thought, but I, okay. Because I feel like it's like, if you ever, if you ever lived with somebody who has mental health issues, right. And I, you know, or, or dealt with it for a long period of time, it gets to the point where you're like, fuck, I got to take a break. I'm sad now. Or you've seen them kind of like break down. Mm -hmm. But because of social media and and lazy journalism and then kind of going like, oh, um, they all hated this one piece of entertainment. But it's this group of people who maybe don't they're too sensitive to some or, or, or maybe they're dealing with yeah. some shit. But they but the media grabs it throws it out there as if this is how everybody feels for all the time and you're responsible for it. If you're a functioning normal human being, or maybe you've got your shit in check, do you then become that person living with somebody who's dealing with mental health shit and it's affecting the way you live? Because now it's like, it's like, it's why I feel like a lot of family members who maybe like generationally argue over stupid shit, whether it's, you know, um, you know, political trans rights or, or whatever it is where they're like constantly feeling like, they're making people feel like shit when really that's not the case. You know what I mean? Like I'm probably explaining this poorly. I should have formed this better, but well, like, you know what I'm saying? Do you think there's an issue with that? Do you think that's like, you know, <clears throat> cascading over everything? 
I love this question. And I've been thinking about this a lot because I've been doing a lot of reading lately in terms of like, um, like attachment styles, right? So, so people mm. have different attachment styles, like avoidant, anxious, <laughs> avoidant, <laughs> all, all of that stuff, right? Okay. Yeah. So I've been, I, I'm like really, really interested in attachment styles um, and how people function, right? So, sure. you know, one, a huge thing around attachment styles is do you see the world again? This is sort of like what the world owes you. Um, do you right. see the world as having a responsibility for your feelings or do you see yourself as having a responsibility for your feelings? Okay. So somebody who is an anxious attachment person, mm -hmm. they see the world as being responsible for how they feel. Yeah. So if there's a lot of incoming, they will point to the world and say, Hey world, stop that. Like, don't do that because I'm going to feel a certain kind of way if you keep doing that. Now, avoidance or the opposite, right? So mm -hmm. they look at the world and they will say, I am responsible for my own stuff. I regulate me. I don't care what's going on out there. There could be like stuff blowing up and so forth. I'm going to regulate and maintain yeah. and I'm going to be like, Bleep, no, no, nothing. Now, there are pros and cons to both of those. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, you know, at a certain point, if there's like all sorts of stuff going on out in the world, you know, and you're like, I have no reaction to that whatsoever. Well, that's usually people that were like, you know, potentially highly traumatized as children and they just shut off a switch and, you know, never to be heard from again. Conversely, the anxious folks are the ones who, you know, become very hyper vigilant and they need reassurance because the external world is just coming into them. So yeah. how I would answer that would be, and of course, we don't really talk about these folks anymore, but the, the, the fourth group were the securely attached people, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? So we don't talk about them very much, but yeah. the securely attached folks are the ones who can regulate. They can right. regulate themselves. They can be grounded. They can be present in their own feelings, yet they can also acknowledge that there are some things externally that can have an impact, but they regulate that, yes. right? They say, I'm impacted by that external thing, but I can regulate myself mm -hmm. so that then I can process that yeah. unicorn. So to answer, I would answer your question with attachment style. And basically okay. how I would answer it would be, if you are a securely attached person or, you know, you're somebody who's sort of like secure in your personhood, however you want to frame that. And so things come, there's incoming for you, either from like other people or from, you know, the universe. Most securely attached people will internalize what they're seeing and then will say to themselves, I'm going to regulate myself. And even though I'm having feelings about that, I will regulate. Now, if it becomes a lot, if they have, you know, a partner that is um, has a lot of sort of mental health issues, they may need help regulating that. So maybe they look to a psychiatrist, a psychologist, and they have a support system. Maybe they're dealing with like a narcissist, right? And so they're like, oh, my gosh, like it's this total incoming and I need to tell all my good news to like a friend because that person's not going to be able to hear any of it. So I can't tell them my good stuff, right? right? So they securely attached people can sort of make that universe for themselves. The anxious folks are the ones who are going to have a little bit more problem because they're taking the external stuff. So they might be sitting there looking at Twitter and their partner and so forth and just sort of like being very unable to sort of like regulate that because they're thinking it's all coming into me and I can't handle yeah. it. The avoidant folks, same thing. They're going to just poop, 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 push that. Oh, oh, wait, I don't need any of that. <laughs> and so they're not even regulating anything because they've batted it away. And they're yeah. just like, I'm not hearing that. So um, I hope that partially answers your question. Because the way I see your question is, how well do you deal with the incoming? Right. right. Whether that's from a partner, whether that's from social media. And some people deal with it. They, have a, they struggle with it a lot. Other people bat it away and they will tell you, I feel nothing. I don't hear anything. <laughs> Leave me alone. And you know those people, the ones who are like, yeah, them, right? Well, and then you got the, the third folks that can balance the regulation pretty well. Yeah. Well, that's just it. Like nobody's talking about what we were just talking about. Nobody, not the news, not anybody in, you know, doing any kind of interviewing or anything like that. Because like, and I, I think a good example, too, is like a, a, a comment section on anything posted on Facebook or, or Twitter or whatever. But it's like you'll see like somebody post like um, this, you know, people are having feelings about such and such a show or a movie. 
And then underneath the comment thread, you'll see all the different types of personalities you just listed. 100%. Because this smaller group yeah. finds the show friends to be problematic or offensive or whatever the fuck it is. And it's affecting their mental health. Right. Everybody underneath friends it. Friends is doing it to them. Friends is doing it to them. Right. And then yeah. subsequently, the people who enjoy it. Yeah. And that means family members friends acquaintances or whatever so it's then it's their fault but you yeah. look at those comment threads and what you see yeah. is the people who because i genuinely think everybody's pretty empathetic but i think if you're telling me that i'm a piece of shit because of a show that comforts me and is the turn to my coping mechanism then you get because that's if you look at the comment threads it's fuck you yeah. what are you telling i'm a because i and like I, this show you're out of your fucking mind and then that's you get everybody cool. arguing with each other and it doesn't no, matter i mean i'm using friends as an example but it doesn't matter yeah. what it is that's a little anxious avoidant action going on there, right? Like, yeah. or a little bit like, you know, or however you want to phrase it. That's that's to people who sort of like worldview is that the, the universe owes them something. In this case, it's to regulate them. Right. So you have people who who look at you, like let's take you, John. Like, so John, right. you need to regulate me. And how right. you regulate me is you don't say certain things to me and you mm -hmm. don't do certain things around me. And you should know that. And when you trigger me, you're triggering me and you should like figure that out because right. you are responsible for regulating me. I'm not responsible for regulating me. I can't regulate me. Whatever's going on with me, I can't regulate me. Right. You need to regulate me. And if you can't do that, we're going to have a big old fight. It's not going to be pretty. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I recognize myself in that statement and it, it hurts. It hurts a little bit. <laughs> and then the opposite are the people who like, I regulate everything within me. You can't say anything to me. You could call me a piece of crap. You could say whatever. Yeah. It affects me not. It bounces off me because I'm the Teflon of feelings. And you could just mm -hmm. bing, 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 bing. I don't feel anything. And you're like, do you feel anything? It's like, no, I do not. I don't feel anything. I'm just the bing, bing, bing person. Right. I don't feel anything. Right? So that's the person at the opposite end of the pendulum. By the way, those folks usually get together. <laughs> A lot of the people that usually, you yeah. know. <laughs> but but I feel like I have been both of those people in my yes. life. And I think that you should well, be able to, yeah. like when you were a kid, when I was a kid, I was very much that that type of person. And I don't want to, like, I do struggle with sometimes. I'm like, God, do I feel fucking anything? Because you could literally do all, everything you just said. And I don't know if that's, that's from stand up or just from having like idiots say shit to me 24 seven, where I'm like, if you let it get to you, you can't fucking function. And I used to be right. one of those people who like, you know, I, I mean, I used to be, when I was a kid, I went from being afraid of my own shadow and the dark and whatever it was to like, you know, I don't really give a shit about much now. Like that mm -hmm. does it that I can't, like if it's something I can't specifically control, I'm like, mm -hmm. what are you going to do? Well, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. And most healthy people, you know, there's a continuum. Like you have, you know, moment and you, you know, there's certain people yeah. that, you know, you're going to be a little different around and so forth. And so you can sort of, there's like, you know, a little bit, it's when you're at the opposites and you stay there, you know, yeah. when you just always look at the world as having a responsibility to regulate you. And so then to your point, when you social media hits you with something or your spouse says something, they always have a responsibility yeah. to regulate your emotion. And I mean, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about like that somebody else has a responsibility for your stuff that you don't have. Mm -hmm. Not because you don't want it. I mean, maybe you do. I don't know. But you can't do it. These are folks who legit cannot like regulate themselves. Right. You can't just see like, sit in their stuff. Don't you think then that the large portion of the society has put us in a position though, where we have like, cause I never want to be that person who is just like, Hey, listen, like, I I'm really not that person. I think individually one-on-one, -on -one, I try very, very hard to be like, uh, I hear you. I don't want to fuck you up. You're a close mm -hmm. friend, whatever the fuck it is. But I think these strangers that we don't see every day that are on the internet that are complaining about this shit, you kind of want to be like, fuck your mental health. Guy. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm just trying to live my life. And I think this, particular comics fucking hilarious and i don't want them to go you know what i mean like i you don't want to be that person but it's creating a rift like having to pay attention to the unstable 24 fucking seven <laughs> i think is creating a fucking problem right like i don't know because i know that sounds heartless no, no. and insane but i really do feel like god like there used to be like 
it's it's that it's that weird line that people tread where I never want to sound like I'm a guy who, first of all, I'm a white male. Fucked right right now. You know what I mean? So I never want to be time for you, but it's I, I like you a lot. So you know I appreciate it. No, no, but I, I really like I know and I know people who know me know this, but like people, there's people who don't know me. So like I never want to be that guy who's like who looks like I am. Yeah, you yeah, know, insensitive or yeah, yeah, yeah. who's great. who's on who's airbing on the side of like a uh, you know like PC woke blah 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 jerk off jerk off you know whatever um I'm gonna wipe that out of the show but uh, <laughs> <laughs> first real <laughs> edit uh, <laughs> um but uh but but like you know that kind of shit because like I'm I don't feel that way specifically but I think when it's when you when it's a this pressure cooker situation where you're like look I gotta fucking be me and like people used to just go to see a movie like I think it's put us in the position where I hate the fact that everyone has to talk about like like I have friends who I'll watch something with and if mm -hmm. they laugh at it and it's inappropriate and it's wrong which ninety percent of laughter is laughing at the wrong thing if it's done yeah. artfully and correctly yeah. it's a yeah. release it's cathartic yeah. Yeah. it's fun. Yeah. Um, but like you'll watch something with them and they'll laugh at it and then immediately turn to you and go, but oh. also just so you know, oh, yeah. and you just want to be like, fuck yeah. off. Like I we've known each other for 20 something years. There's no you don't... comment thread on this interaction. Thank you. Oh like, my fucking You don't God. have to be afraid of getting judged. Perfectly put. Exactly. <laughs> right. You're like, oh, just you know, like, but they're like, oh, you know, just so we know, I, I shouldn't have, you know, technically. Uh, they are representative of, a, and you're like, I don't, I don't fuck. I'm just laughing at Ryan Reynolds. Can I just <laughs> laugh at Ryan fucking Reynolds and go and no, eat I, popcorn? Maybe get a heart attack. I don't know. You know what I mean? That's the thing that you're saying. I I co-sign and I agree with, and I feel yeah. like I know you well enough. Although again, I always chuckle that I've never met you in real life. I so know we're. Um, oh, but we're gonna rectify that. We're gonna rectify that. <laughs> hey, we are. We should. Yeah. Now I'm super paranoid that I'm gonna get you sick. By the way, like I'm not, but like if like if you're like we're gonna meet each other in real life, I'm gonna be like Heather. I'm gonna do it in a hazmat suit and a fucking bubble because I know <laughs> I know you've been like way more like I'm, I, mean, I'm, I I still haven't gotten COVID. I know, I mean, dude. It's it's beautiful, but I'm like you know they won't <laughs> let me get my flu shot yet because they're like you're still coughing, buddy. Which which by the way, I'm oh, sorry you were you were saying something. I didn't mean to interrupt you. We'll 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 talk we'll, before we end. We'll. In yeah, like 30 yeah. seconds to bust up a few myths. Um, but no, the only thing I was going to say about that is just, uh, you know, you're, I know you well enough to know that you are a well-meaning person who is not trying to bust somebody's life up with some of what you're saying. Thank you. And so you would hope that people who know you or even people who don't know you would know that's sort of not the default intention but again you know for some people it's just so difficult for them to be able to like regulate do that work for themselves yeah that they really can't so the triggers are just constant for them there's no mm. off switch for triggers for them come from where they might and you know like in in academia we talk a lot about trigger warnings right which by the way the research is like out as to how helpful they are sometimes trigger warnings can actually trigger concern like fear for people of what's to come which is an interesting it's really thing. anticipating it happening right exactly uh, so there's that with trigger warnings and but also how do you know what you don't like unless you watch it like if you're gonna watch gone with the wind for the first time by the way not worth it um but if you're gonna <laughs> watch got you know i don't know maybe educational purposes whatever you're doing it's a it's an okay movie but like if you're gonna watch that for the first time and this thing pops up that says this will fuck you up well, you may not know if you like it or not. Like, I would have never watched horror movies if every fucking horror movie was like, hey, kid, do you want to never sleep until you're 12? And you're like, I, get, I don't know. Then I wouldn't have watched E.T. That also assumes that there are certain universal things that people are all going to be triggered by. Like, for example, something that really I'm doing it now. Like one, there's not very many things that make me do what I'm doing right now. But like when I hear like a Sharpie, like Ooh. on on a piece of paper, I'm like, yeah. so like I was watching the show the other day and it's like somebody was writing with a Sharpie and I mm. they heard and i was like oh uh -huh. no that's a sharpie on paper right so how do you they're not these universal things that we know will just sort of like blanketly trigger people right yeah. there's all sorts of things that can be very upsetting and very disturbing for people and so sort of blanketly saying this will be a trigger to you don't really know what that 
will be. And it can be more terrifying for some people to say that than them just sort of like experiencing what they're going to experience. But again, the, the whole notion of that is that um, the external person is regulating you and the content you get because once you see it, it will be so upsetting for you that you yourself will not be able to regulate yourself. And right. that's something that, you know, I mean, when we think about sort of the, the wonderful world of like therapy and psychiatrists and psychologists, um, you know, that's a space where people can really think about that. And if they can't afford one, you know, are there ways to sort of like seek out help and so forth? Um, but that's a really tough way to go through life to sort of constantly be on guard that people will sort of say something to you and you will be unable to maintain your equilibrium. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think we were going to like <clears throat> finally talk about myths of which yeah. I write about myths all the time, COVID myths. Right. Um, so I, so then I like one of the things I do is I have like a, a sort of like series um, of articles that I do for a, daily, a paper about like COVID myths and like two of them that I'm doing now is um, the myth that you can't get the flu and COVID vaccine together, which is a myth. You can. Um, yeah. There's a couple of studies that show there's like a small uptick in reaction if you get them together, but it's only for people who normally have reactions to getting vaccines. So if you don't do well when you get the flu vaccine, well, wait for it. When you get them both, you're probably going to have a reaction. Um, so that's what that says. And then another myth um, where... <laughs> I'm like smiling because I'm like, I guess we are still dealing with these things, but yeah. the myth that like masks are harmful, right? So there's like All this right. myth for people that, oh, well, if we hadn't been wearing masks, then people would have just built up an immunity to like everything and then we'd all be okay and fine. And that myth is not really um, supported. And in fact, you know, the counter to that would be just keep your mask on. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Like, just keep it on. Don't take it off. Like, you maybe you should just keep wearing it. There's, right. you know, like, there's no medical downside to wearing a mask. Um, so maybe you should keep it on. So right. those are like a couple of myths that I'm. So doing. what about that? So I mean, I because I didn't get my flu shot, which I mm -hmm. guess there's still a point in getting it, obviously, or whatever it is. But I got sick, so I had to stave off getting the 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 flu shot that I was supposed mm -hmm. to get because I got the other thing. But they still, if they're like, they're my pharmacy anyway, I don't know, maybe I should go somewhere else, but they're very much like, if you're still taking stuff and if you're still sick, you can't get the flu shot. Mm, that's interesting. And I'm still coughing. So I'm like, how fucking long am I supposed to go without like- Are you talking about antibiotics or something like that? Yeah. Okay. Do they, do, does your pharmacist think that you had the flu or something? Is that what they think? No, they don't think I had the flu, but they think if you're still sick, it's just going to make, like, I don't, I don't know. Like, if I don't know if they're like- thinking it's gonna i don't know what they're thinking to be quite honest i but have like, to believe it's like a liability thing like oh. they can't be held responsible when, when things go <laughs> right right yeah because i i mean i'm still taking the cot like uh, i'm still on that what is it ben's whatever i can't think of what the fucking name of that shit is but i'm still taking that to like because i'm still hacking up a lung at night if i'm sleeping yeah. like you know Do you, is your what did your did your coughing stay from the first time you had covid or no. was it Okay. This is this is recently. I mean, I've got it for when whenever I think it's about a, a little over a month. And um, it's still, still have it. This cough. Yeah, but only if I'm this is stupid. But only I, if when I'm in bed, when I'm lying down, I cannot. I mean, I can feel it. Like I cannot stop coughing, and it's just this mm -hmm. involuntary shit. It'll wake me up sometimes. I'll even take like the cough medicine or whatever. And I went to my doctor, and she was annoyed because um, she was just like, I don't know why you're here. Um, you had, cause I went to the, you know, I went to the ER to get like checked and stuff. So they did the whole like RSV flu COVID strap you know, yeah. three times, Yeah. but I was like, I can't stop. You got to do something about this. And they were like, no. And then I went to her and I was like, Hey, I just thought I should come to you. And she was just like, you, all you have is a, uh, what did she say? She's like, all you have is a virus. You have to let it run through your system. I don't know why you're here. And I was just like, Oh, a hug. Okay, I get like I don't know. I don't know why I'm here either. I just thought you'd give me more shit to take. But yeah, that's their answer for it. So I mean, I you know, there are some very good I know we've had this conversation before, but there are some very good, you know, COVID centers in the northeast um that help, you know. Oh yeah. Could be, you think it's long COVID? 
Yeah, that's why I was asking you when. Ooh. When I had COVID, I've been fine up until I had COVID uh, in May of 2021. Okay. So like I and I haven't had it since. It but like this, whatever I got this time around when okay. and I wasn't, you know, I've tested three times for it. Um, and not each, COVID. yeah, not COVID and not the flu and not RSV. Not does COVID, does long COVID affect like, um, like, does it make you more prone to having upper respiratory problems? It makes you more prone to like lots of different things. <laughs> wow. Okay. See, that's, I mean, that goes to John's question earlier is, you know, if you get COVID multiple times and what does that do to your immune system and what does it mm -hmm. do to your ability to fight off other random things? And the answer is we don't know, which I know is not um, comforting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Jackie, I agree with you, Jackie. It's a, it's a, it's a, I mean, like, th this is the space we've gotten to. The Jackie is trying to just do her thing yeah. and wear a mask and not be bothered. And but some, it's also huh. like her personal choice. If you're right. saying, if you're saying personal choice is important to you to the point that you don't want to wear a mask, mm -hmm. why do you care? Yes, yeah. that's it. It. It's what we call hypocrisy. <laughs> that's the power. Yeah. Yes, I don't know why people care what Jackie is doing. To leave yeah. Jackie alone and let Jackie live Jackie's best life, not getting COVID. Because if Jackie's <laughs> wearing a nice mask, which is, Jackie sounds like a responsible person, I'm sure Jackie is. Yeah, Jackie will be safeguarded from COVID. Yeah. The rest of the people not wearing masks, I really can't speak for what's going to happen with them. I agree. Will be less safeguarded. I so, wore my mask to a grocery store the other day, and Jersey's not doing shit lately i don't know what it is but i swear <laughs> to god this older dude i thought he was gonna have a conniption like oh, it was it was uh i had my mask on i was behind him in line and the young cashier had his mask on and the person that was over who was also working had their mask on and you could just see like the like he just turned he, like the rage like and he just so like <laughs> Like he couldn't, like he needed desperately to turn to somebody else who didn't have a mask and be like, fucking pussies. But there was no one there to do it with. There was nobody. So, yeah. Right. And we were just like, sorry, guys. And again, <laughs> the anti trigger warning people are getting triggered. Yes. Like, that's crazy. Of yeah. Us. Exactly. Oh. exactly. And, you know, I got to tell you, I'm surprised we haven't had more of, I'm surprised we haven't had more of people who point to like people wearing masks saying you're just throwing it in my face like what what why are you doing that I right. can't, i'm surprised i i mean i'm surprised we haven't had more of that um maybe that's coming at a later point um but i, I it, it is very sad that, that jackie is trying to safeguard herself from covid and she feels as though she's being judged by other people that is not that is not where we want to be. Right. Not as a society. It's really not a space we want to be. And yes, to Diana's point, it, it, if you if you want to have the freedom to not wear a mask, one would think you would then afford somebody the courtesy to wear a mask, you know, judgment free. Mm -hmm. And can you so before we go to because you were talking to me about the what is it the bi, they call it the bivalent oh, bivalent vaccine. Bivalent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Um, the important so you were telling me before to question to make sure that the uh my pharmacy which i'm glad i did because they was they i had to go somewhere else but um uh to make sure they have it does everybody have it by now or no or are you still yeah, have to so, add? so by now if you're getting a booster that's what you're getting so the bivalent okay. vaccine <laughs> um the right bivalent booster th this is actually i'm so glad you asked this and this is a good note i guess for us to end on but the bivalent booster is a companion to the primary series that you would have already had to have gotten before you get the booster. So if you walk into a pharmacy and you're like, hit me with the bivalent. <laughs> well, what did you have before that? Nothing. <laughs> I'm vaccine free, right? That's right. how any of that works. Um, mm. You would need to get your primary series and then you would get the bivalent booster. Now, this is why for years i can't believe i'm gonna say years but yeah. for years now we have been uh really um stressing that you get your primary series because the bivalent booster is tailored to um the omicron 
uh, variant. Mm -hmm. And so, and and now all of the variants that we are seeing are sub some sub lineage of that specific. So we haven't seen any other variant take over in the way that um, Omicron has since really Delta. Now it's just like all of these children and grandchildren and great grandchildren of Omicron are what we're seeing. So now the latest one is BQ1 1.1. Right. Um, they are prevalent. Interestingly enough, in China, it's a totally different one. It's a BF. It, it's it's got some interesting um, mutations that are, are making it. And, and I mean, again, I know people don't want to think about what's about to happen or what's happening in China. But, uh, you know, China essentially has, as much as people sort of conspiracy theory about what happened in China actually over the last three years, it, it does appear that China for the last three-ish years was able to, through some pretty um, strict measures, batten down the spread of COVID. That is no longer the case because they are releasing a lot of that. I think people should pay very close attention to what is happening in China and what will happen in China over the next several weeks and months. Because if the numbers in China start to look anything like numbers that we've had in this country or even some of the other countries, you were talking about over a billion people. That Those percentages are going to get out of control very quickly and we will see something we have not seen on the global scale before is over 1 billion people having an exposure um, that is going to, it's going to look like something we haven't seen before. Oh, so um, I just, to, to, to put that in, you know, a certain kind of perspective, we're having our own upswings now and we're having our own um, surges and we're having them because we have these, you know, now, Apparently, you know, a small percentage of people have actually gotten the bivalent um, vaccine. So in New York City, it's about 14% of people. Uh, that's tiny, yeah. given that we now have these uh, surges. And remember, the original series that people got is not specific to um, the new variant. Right. So you have, you know... 80 ish percent of people that are protected against a disease that is no longer. Right. Um, not in the way that it was. So you do have to get the primary series, then you get the the, you know, the bivalent that's that's available now. Um, and then the research shows that while it's not necessarily gonna stop you from getting COVID, it will stop you from being hospitalized more likely than not, and it will stop you from um, death, <laughs> which, which you should care about. You should care yeah. about everything, okay? Um, so my advice for people is to seriously consider getting this booster. Uh, seriously consider getting the booster. If you've not already gotten the vaccine, I would implore you to really consider it. If you're not going to do any of that, I would say wear a mask. So if you just for whatever reason, you cannot bring it yourself to get the vaccine or the booster, I would say you should be thinking about wearing a mask. And if you can't do any of that, um, then you're going to find yourself in harm's way and, and you will be putting other people, possibly loved ones or strangers in harm's way as well. And that right. is public health. That yeah. is what we do what we do. Very nice. Um, I love that we ended on doom and gloom. Yeah, that's uh, the, that's the China. Yeah. I mean, that's real. It is. It is China, real. Yeah, exactly. I would just so for the two <clears throat> keep an eye on China. And yeah, I will. It's going to get uh, challenging. Let's put it that way. Challenging, I think, is the best way. Because remember, again, they're not dealing with the novel coronavirus, COVID nineteen. Right. They are dealing with a much you know the 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 newest variant basically the the factor that determines how contagious it is um ba5 so for every if you had it you would transmit it to five people the variant in china 
it's between 10 and 18 people. Oh, wow. So for every Jesus. one person that gets it, the transmission rate is between 10 and 18 people will get it from that one person. Holy shit. So, you know, and BA5 was pretty, pretty difficult. So like you exponentially, you know, you could do that. That is going to, and again, that's 1.3 billion people, 1.2 billion people. So that's a wow. lot of one to one to 10, one to 18 ratios. And how is this going to affect crypto? I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> just ending on a nobody gives a shit. I just asking. <laughs> no, that is that is fucking alarming though. That is that is crazy yeah, shit. It's trippy. And remember, a lot of our travel bans are gone the way of the dodo bird. So there's nothing to stop people just going here and there. I mean, you know, what's what's stopping people from just hopping on planes right now? I mean, nothing yeah. that I know of. So I you know. I love that I named this show Dystopia Tonight as a joke when I first oh, did it, and no, it's become like worse. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's we're in it. Yeah, yeah we're in it deep, deep. I was like, wouldn't it be funny? And then like, <laughs> and then no, it turns out it's not. <laughs> it's, it's well, it's, not. it's it has its own charm, but it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Real. it's pretty real. Strange, but yeah, <laughs> holy fucking shit. Yeah. <laughs> What did I put out in the universe? Holy fuck. Yeah. Um, you, you still got a teeny tiny window to get yourself, you know, your booster. And if you're, you know, yeah, I'm going to do it tomorrow. <laughs> oh, see? Now that I've just gotten well again, I'm going to do it. Yeah. Good. I love it. That's great. That, okay, good. So, so mask, hand washing, all of that stuff. You know, if you're not feeling well, stay away from people. You absolutely. know? Absolutely. Don't, don't start doing the Wednesday dance with them. <laughs> don't do awesome. that. Under that. Uh, thank you so so much for joining us and coming okay. on. And Diana, thank you for joining me. It was as yes. well. great meeting we're, you. We gotta, we gotta have like, I mean, this gotta be like a thing, you know? What I mean? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, I, I love I'll, it. And I, I love this. This is fucking great. We should talk about more mental health shit too, because that was fucking awesome. We 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 should. And I mean, could you know? You know, I'm looking at my the the book. You know, my the second book I wrote is about mental health. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, plug it. You got it on you. Plug it. Throw it up. Healing Civil War Veterans in New York and Washington, D.C. Oh, nice. Wow. <laughs> that's the one that Jackie said she was looking at when she thought you lived in D.C. Ah, oh, that's so cool. Oh, it's Jackie. I got you. I got you. See, so the <laughs> first one, I, I don't have my books just sitting around as I just whip them out. I was actually looking at them, specifically this one, because the epilogue of the book talks about um, Civil War Oh, that's so sweet, Jackie. Oh my goodness. Oh, I heart you so much, Jackie. Um, this 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 book, the epilogue actually talks about morphine addiction um mm. during the Civil War. And my my theory is that we basically have just sort of through um, you know, epigenetics and transgenerational trauma have carried um the morphine type addiction with us into the new opioid era. Oh, so that's geez. my, that's a theory in book. So that's why I was looking at it because I was thinking to myself about trauma and um, where we are now that, uh, I mean, obviously anybody who's highly addicted to opioids, I would imagine they've got something going on in their life that is not rosy and cheery, right. which is why oh, they are God. ingesting opioids. Uh, Absolutely. At that um, and so, yeah. And, then, and the first book is just about black, black surgeons during the civil war. Um, so I don't have them just sitting around like, ah. <laughs> you should always have them sitting yeah, around. I never do. I never have them anywhere. And people are like, you need to like get your act together and have you booked out. I'm like, eh, nah, that's fine. Nobody needs to read them. <laughs> I'll plug them in my Instagram. I'll share the links and stuff to them. And the, that's Amazon very sweet. I yeah. appreciate that. I appreciate um, that. Both of you hang out in two seconds because I'm just going to end this thing. Bye. Utopia tonight.